All right, well, our next speaker is Viola Burse, who in this group really needs no introduction, but since it's my official job to introduce her, I'll just go ahead with that uh, while she's setting up. So Viola Burse is a professor of chemistry and a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Materials for Fuel Cells and Related Energy Applications here at the University of Calgary. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, as well as of the Canadian Society for Chemistry and the Electrochemical Society. Her research areas include the development of sulfur and coke tolerant SFC anodes, materials for the catalysis of oxygen reduction and alcohol oxidation in lower temperature applications. Uh, as you know, she's the scientific co-director of the network and she'll be talking today on understanding and enhancing sulfur and oxygen tolerance of nickel-based anodes. Great, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much Olivera. So hopefully I might move this up a little bit if you can hear me. Yes, back there. Good. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about a fraction of the work uh, that we that we actually did over those five plus years. Uh, with the time limitations and so forth, and the fact that we're down to just the one day for our scientific program. Um, and on this slide, uh, I note the collaborators and people that we've benefited from, particularly on this topic. And you can see there Tom Ziegler and Max um, Kunal for many interesting discussions, and thank goodness I placed myself right where I have in the program, because some of what he just talked about is a good precursor for our work. And I've also, uh, Abert for help with XPS and OJ, and then um, some groups, all coincidentally perhaps at Imperial College London, where some of the students went for their SNE visits, as they're called. And thank you, of course, to, to the funding that supported this particular work. Oops, that's funny, okay. So again, we, we have these highly qualified personnel slides, and you can see a large number of people have been involved in the work in my group. That top bunch, uh, the blue, in fact, the blue everywhere are the students that are actually here, students and postdocs. And um, that top group was w working in some way or another on sulfur issues, nickel, and oxygen as well, o nickel oxide issues. And there are some in fact, I'm not going to be able to talk about all of your work. I'm just already apologizing to some of the students, even in that top uh, group here. And these individuals are all here, and they've been working on other parts of Themes 3B and, and, and some of the other areas. But wonderful students all together, very lucky. And uh, thank you to you all, of course. So um, here's what I put as the research questions that underpin what I'm going to talk about just in this short talk. Um, Kunal already alluded, and, and others before, Subash before, that H2S can be a problem in nickel-based SOFCs. Um, we, we know that in natural gas, sulfur is present at PPM levels, but even PPM levels can be a problem. Um, and of course, we have deodorizers uh, and so forth, so they can also be a problem. So one of the questions we tried to address is how serious is this problem actually? I wanted to get quite quantitative with, with this question. Just don't want to flip too far. Um, exactly what kind of poisoning do we have as a function of temperature and, and H2S concentration? So that was certainly one. Also in real fuels. We know that um, there will be sulfur problems. How can we either minimize that, remove the sulfur, what can we do to mitigate that problem? We also had known from earlier work, I'll say something more later, that a little bit of oxygen could go a long way in removing sulfur from nickel, also coke, uh, but then we have the risk of nickel oxidation, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. And then more generally, those last two bullets are, you know, what else can we do? How else can we tweak compositions, microstructures? And most importantly, from my perspective is, as a chemist, actually, is how can we understand what's going on? So we were, a lot of our work was focused on trying to understand that. And in so doing, we, we discovered some nifty little things, and those are really what I'm going to talk about today. Okay, so where do I go from here? So I'm going to start, I've got two parts to this talk. One is about nickel and sulfur, low PPM sulfur. Then I'm gonna slide over to the oxygen exposure work, which is tied to the sulfur project. 
So I'm going to start straight into some data because we had the literature issues already covered a little bit by Kunal. So this is a plot of current as a function of time as you run hydrogen, humidified hydrogen, hydrogen through the cell and then bring in just 5 ppm H2S, you can see that the current drops. When you remove the H2S, it goes back up again, but slowly, it slowly recovers. And you can see the effect at different temperatures. And immediately you'd be able to see that as you lower the temperature, the currents fall, and that makes sense. SOCs perform less well at lower currents. Uh, what you can also see is that the, I'll show you more in the next slide, that the effect seems to get worse at lower temperatures, and that is what's actually predicted. And so you can see that there. So in this plot, and I already didn't quite say it, but I, I go, many of you do know that we, we have observed something very interesting at lower temperatures, and that is what I'm going to talk about today. But this is percent current loss, and you can see that at 700, 750, 800 is not on here, but in fact, there's a range of values here of losses from 20, maybe to 35%. And unfortunately, one of our goals was not ever met, namely to give very precise percent poisoning at each temperature. We were not able to achieve that goal. That could be part of discussion, I guess. Um, but what was so interesting to us, and we've seen it now time and time again, is that as we move to the lower temperatures, 600, 550, 500, that would be what you would encounter if you wanted to go to a metal supported SOC, for example, our theme 3A goal. And of course, many people in the literature are trying to go to still lower temperatures. What we saw over and over again is that we'd introduce H2S and the current would go up, not down. And when we removed H2S, we lost activity. So I know we all, you, many of you heard this earlier from me, but um, indeed, we, we see that over and over again. This on the right is for a fresh anode, never, never uh, seen H2S at higher temperatures. And you can see at 500 degrees, when you bring H2S in, the current goes up. When you take it out, it goes down. And on the, in the bullets there, hopefully you can see them, we have put this through every possible pace of uh, types of cells, two electrode, three electrode, open circuit, polarized, positively polarized, negatively, different cells, holders, et cetera, and so forth, and this result has persisted. So what we did is we um, started to think about what could this be, and I put here Ni3S2 in the right-hand corner, bottom, and so we, we started to look at the literature on this, and we found for sure that we, we, we know that Javier's group in Ottawa has seen that when you completely convert nickel to nickel sulfide under other conditions, they too see catalysis of hydrogen oxidation. They go from nickel YSC to Ni3S2 YSC, the current gets better for hydrogen oxidation. So, so there's that. On the other hand, Kunal just pointed out that our conditions should not really produce this stuff. They're, they're, there's not enough sulfur, temperature's not high enough uh, or low enough, either one. So really we shouldn't have that. At the same time, we have groups like Nigel Brandon's and Malin Liu's, very respectable groups, who are all doing this and that with sulfur, and they do see hints of some sulfur phases in their electrodes. So there was that on the other side. So we took a two-pronged attack here. We did, I turned to uh, Max, wherever he's sitting, somewhere I can't even see. Thank you, Max, I might need you for, if, we'll see. Uh, but Max and Tom, on the theory side, while we pursued heavier experimentation to try to verify what we, what we are forming. So I'm going to be quick on these next two slides. These are the slides that Max provided for me. Basically what he did is he, he looked then, because we were also heavily influenced by Javier Georgi's results, he looked at Ni3S2 uh, as a phase on YSC, so this phase, and just as you heard earlier, uh, they had to work on what would be the right surface ter termination under our conditions, if you, if you could make it survive. They ended up with this phase called S2, so here's the nickel sulfide. This, for the uninitiated gain, this is in theory the TPB, where this phase and this phase meet, so just to gain TPB. And so the S2 phase was, was taken for this study and moved through the calculations. Oops, that jumped too. 
So here is um, uh, just one quick result on all of this, and uh, it shows the nickel 3s2 phase on YSC. A little tiny hydrogen molecule here, I see how small it is, comes along, it plucks out, it breaks up, plucks out an O2 minus ion and makes water. And what was so interesting when they did this work, uh, Max is here to explain if needed, it shows that this is a very favorable process and that you should expect catalysis of hydrogen oxidation at this type of interface. So very, very interesting to us. Um, so now, of course, we're debating, can we prove that we have some Ni3S2 under our conditions? And so that's what went on in, in two, two more slides on this topic. Um, in this case, oops, it went further than I expected, but that's okay. So as I said, Abert Malero in the, in the catalysis um, facility at U of C has been helping us heavily with XPS and OJ spectroscopy. And this is an example of a spectrum looked at more closely, has sulfide features and sulfate features, sulfide and sulfate. The sample was transferred through air to get into the XPS chamber. And so just looking at those features, and this is still fairly weak evidence, I would say, but it's some sort of evidence. Um, the ratio of the sulfate to sulfide is about one to two. The sulfate should be on the surface. In fact, all sulfide should have been converted to sulfate. So ipso facto, any sulfide you see should be beneath the nickel surface. So very loosely, we could say that this is arguing for an average, remember that XPS is not highly resolving, an average uh, indication where there is some sulfide in a subsurface state. And this might then be an incipient Ni3S2, uh, the onset of, of incipient Ni3S2 formation. XRD and OJ showed uh, what they expected. There is no, there's not a lot of sulfide around. It's not visible by XRD. By OJ, it simply maps beautifully that the sulfur is only associating with the nickel and not the YSC, and that's no big surprise. So, so this is this that we've gone along and submitted a paper based on, on those results. In parallel, we've been working with Steve Skinner's group at Imperial College through a SNE visit, as I said, and we're trying a state-of-the-art experiment. Uh, this is, there's only a few of these instruments around on, on, on planet Earth, low energy ion scattering. And the idea is that um, these are meant to be different forms of nickel sulfur, sulfur embedded on the surface, scattered around. XPS has trouble seeing between those. It just doesn't do it very well. Whereas lice can take one atomic layer off at a time and analyze what's, what's been removed. And it can, it can do it layer by layer. So we were hopeful that we would um, get something from that. This is the beginnings of our results. We definitely have more trips ahead. And what you see here is the counts of sulfur against dose, I'll just rather say depth, but it's this sort of uh, removal rate, let's say. And so it, what it shows, and, and the one that might be of most interest to us is this turquoise one. It does show sulfur at the surface it does seem to indicate it that it's subsurface, not just monolayer surface. So it is looking promising to, to give us the kind of numbers we want. Those of you who are reading the bullets ahead of me, you'll see we, these are still challenging, very challenging experience, experiments. This is you know, heavy surface science, and we've got issues with surface roughness we have to overcome. We've had an impurity problem, but overall this, I think, we hope, that this might, might take us along. Okay, so um, this is just the summary of the, the longest part of my talk, which is this section, just to say that we haven't, we, we definitely see that as you lower the temperature from 900 down to 650, sulfur poisoning kind of gets worse, not at the levels we expected and not in a nice trend in our results. Below that, we get this interesting catalytic effect, not always at 650 sometimes, but certainly at 500 always, 550 almost always, etc. We have some support that it could be an Ni3S2, maybe formed predominantly at TPBs, or maybe formed locally because the pH2, pH2S ratio is not what you expect everywhere or controlled everywhere. So. Um, and those are the techniques that are, that are helping us hopefully unravel that. 
Okay. So, but I wanted to turn now to try to link the sulfur and oxygen work. So, um, in fact, as I said with the first bullet, if you're up at those normal operating temperatures, sulfur is a problem. And the question is, how can we remove it? And um, so we'd, as I said earlier, we thought about, can we use oxygen to kind of strip it off? And so let's look at this issue with stripping off sulfur with oxygen. So we, we've seen this before. We know that we can regenerate uh, sulfide po sulfur poison nickel anodes with a little bit of oxygen. Uh, but the problem is that you can also make this nickel oxide. And thankfully, Partho talked about it this morning, that the expansion of nickel to nickel oxide is such that when it occurs in the wrong way, it can just crack everything, cause stresses, and fracture the electrolyte. And uh, what Jason did in some work is he designed, this isn't a real cell. Um, what you can see is it's a nickel support layer, the support layer, the electrochemically active layer, a thin electrolyte, and we're looking at the top down on this. And you can see that if you 100% oxidize the nickel phase at high temperatures versus lower, there's a very big difference here. It's, it's much worse at high temperatures. We thought this was thermal shock, but it really isn't. The fact that the number of cracks per unit distance versus temperature is much worse there turns out to be about the mechanism of nickel oxide formation. It's, it's such that if you run this, do this at high temperatures, as you start oxidizing it, the outside gets oxidized heavily, the inside is hardly oxidized, and you get this bad gradient that causes increasing stress on the electrolyte, whereas at low temperatures, every nickel particle kind of equally oxidizes, and that's a safer kind of condition. So anyways, we've learned about nickel oxidation, so now, how can we, can we use this for, for sulfur removal, and, but not have this cracking problem? How do we do that? How do we bring oxygen in, get rid of the sulfur, the coke maybe, but don't have this problem? So, we, this is a kind of a convoluted long story, but I'm going to try to be quick. There's only a few more slides. So long ago in discussions with what was then Global Thermoelectric and Tony and others, we talked about could we apply a reverse bias? Could we turn the polarity of the cell around while the oxygen was coming in so that any um, oxide that might form, we could scoot it back to nickel quickly? So in other words, could we kind of cathodically protect the nickel while we brought the oxygen in to strip out the sulfur? Complicated thing. Anyways, you can see that we've, there are pieces of evidence out there that this can be done. The problem is, how do you prove it? And one way you can quench and then try to look for oxygen. And it's hard, though. All the imaging studies are hard. So our goal here was, could we track the weight, the mass, of the, of the cell while we expose it to oxygen? And this, this is what we're trying. Could we see, we would hope to see no mass change. That would mean there's been no nickel oxidation. Could we do that? So again, I have to give very good credit to uh, Jason's great hands with instrumentation. What he has constructed is, is a means by which you can put a little baby cell into, and again for TGA, thermogravimetric analysis, measure mass at high temperatures, various atmospheres. And he managed to do this very nicely, actually, and he used conditions and materials, as you see here. We assume that any mass change we see has to come from the nickel. Platinum should be inert, we think, under these conditions. YSC should be inert. So we assume any mass changes we see, it's nickel oxidation or preventing nickel oxidation. Just quickly, two slides. Um, the first thing we did is, can we even do electrochemistry inside this TGA, you know, little tiny cell hanging deep down with leads and what have you? And those of you who do electrochemistry will look at this and say, this looks like not a great cell, but you'd say it looks very familiar. In other words, the impedance looks right. Uh, the impedance is this and this. The CVs look you know, the right shape and everything. They do the right things as well. They activate with cycling. So everything looks right. So coming to the last slide, which is the most complicated. Sorry, I got, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you guys to look just at the red trace. So just at the red, we're gonna look just at the red traces. And I'm gonna tell you that the red is the mass gain 
up his mass gain with time. And here, where the cell is in a hydrogen environment, then we throw in a bit of nitrogen to prevent explosions in the TGA, which we did have. Bring in oxygen, then nitrogen, then hydrogen. Starting with the dashy line, the dashy line is what you see when you're just at open circuit. You're just letting nickel be ex see oxygen, and the mass gain is equivalent to full oxidation of all the nickel that's there. So that is a 100% oxidized, you can see, you can reduce it. Then, I'm just showing one of the results. This is the case with a negative current applied during the same experiment. Of course, you can see that the mass gain is much less. As soon as you even bring nitrogen in, you can get rid of, you can get rid of that mass and then it stays off. So um, these plots show, um, and then, then I'm just going to be summarizing. I have no idea where my time is, but how about five minutes? Excellent, good. Okay, so this is a plot, very shrimpy, I'm sorry, I can see how small this is. This is percent nickel oxidized. This is 100 down to zero. Both of these are percent nickel oxidized. Remember, we don't want that. And, on, and this is with negative current density applied. This is with negative potential. So the, and what you can see is the bigger the bias you apply, the less mass is gained by the nickel. Now we reach sort of a semi-limit of about 40% protection, that's here. Beyond that, I think we, we have challenges and we'll, we'll just leave it at that. So, but still, this is showing that we could uh, potentially protect nickel from oxidation with a ne negative bias, maybe then being able to use oxygen in a useful way to strip off unwanted materials. Okay. So. Last, so this is a summary, but there are, there's a little fresh result here that Jason got at, on his most recent SNE visit. Um, so basically, reverse bias does seem to work, and, and you can do it, and that's good. It can be done with this in operando uh, TGA, and we would hope not yet proven that we can take off this, or prevent or remove carbon and sulfur deposition. Okay, so this is the interesting result because you think, oh gee, only 40% protection. You may not be able to see this very well, but this is the in situ Raman work that we've been doing with um, Rob Mayer, mostly Rob Mayer at Imperial. And what it shows, and I don't know quite, um, maybe I'll just look at this, is that if you track the amount of nickel oxide after one of these negative bias experiments, in the support layer, that's where most of the oxygen is, where the oxygen down where all the electrochemistry is happening and where the electrolyte is, is almost not there. In other words, the negative bias has probably protected the right area of the cell. It's, it's deep inside the anode. Okay, a couple little things. Uh, maybe I can just do those two things together. Um, you know, that it seems, as I said, I wanted to talk about kind of nifty little things rather than our whole program. And of course, I had to miss so many other things, but I think anybody who's, you know, is doing battery work or capacitor work or corrosion work or something to be able to do where you need electrochemistry plus mass changes under high temperature weird conditions, I think this could work. And then the last point is that there are other developments and other ways in which the nickel oxide formation problem can be minimized. I'm just saying we avoid those gradients. There are ways to do that. And there are some pretreatment steps that Jason's just working on. We're just kind of touching at the beginning of that. So I will stop there. How did I do time-wise? I left a few minutes? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Okay. So, so with that, we have about two minutes for questions. Does anybody have any questions for our speaker? I'll bring the microphone to you. Yep. Oh, thank you. Uh, very interesting results, uh, yep, Viola. Um, it is well known in the in the literature, and it is even applied in the industrial uh, reforming, to partially poison nickel with sulfur to avoid carbon formation. And this is uh, attributed to the fact that when we have partially poisoned nickel, the size of the grains of the nickel decreases, ef yeah. efficient, catalytically efficient, and this is considered as the cause of the less carbon formation. But uh, given what you have produced, that uh, the uh, sulfided nickel facilitates the oxygen 
uh, the oxidation of the molecules at the surface, is it possible that this uh, effect is due to the uh, more labile oxygen uh, movement at the surface of this species instead of having decreased this, the, 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 uh, the carbon formation rate? Well, we haven't done the carbon work. That's, um, we're, not, we're not doing that kind of carbon work. Here we only see that what oxygen will do is remove the sulfur. Whether it changes the nickel mm -hmm. structure, that's not clear. Now we have, I took the bullet out because I just knew I was going to run out of time. Um, we have other work that has shown exactly what you said, that sulfur will stop coking uh, in CO environments, um, syngas environments. So that, that's true, and we have other yeah, fresh results. But results. the exact mechanism is not still very clear in, 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 in the literature. Probably not. There are, there are just assumptions, speculations, but not probably. clear evidence of that. Thank you very much. We have good evidence, but probably the explanations aren't fully clear, yeah. Okay, well that takes us to the next uh, time slot, so I'd like to invite our next speaker to come up.